Okay, welcome everyone. So uh, tonight uh, we'll be um, having a great discussion about liver cancer for this CME series through the Yale Cancer Center. My name is Stacy Stein. I'm a GI medical oncologist with a focus in hepatobiliary cancers, and I'm very excited to share updates with you in liver cancer. I have my colleagues here, Dr. Ariel Jaffe, who is an assistant professor of medicine in digestive diseases, and she'll be talking to us from the hepatology perspective. And my colleague, Dr. Kevin Billingsley, who's a professor of surgery and chief medical officer here at the Yale Cancer Center, and he'll be talking to us about surgical approaches. Um, we'll have time at the end for questions and discussion, so uh, I'm looking forward to your participation. Um, first, we'll get started with Dr. Jaffe's talk, um, and then we'll we'll go through the program. Thanks so much, Stacey. So let me share my slides. All right. You can see that, right? Yes, it's still in presenter view. Oh, it is. Yeah. How about now? No, I see you clicked on play from start, but it's not going to play from start. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Go back to slideshow. I think. At the top there, yeah. And try play from start again. Still not working? No, I don't see it. Um, I don't know what's different. How about current slide? Anything? You know, I have your slides here. Do you want me to try to open them? Um, you can. I added one more. I don't know why it's not working. Oh. Maybe we ought to do that though, if it's not, okay. it's still it's not showing. It's still in the presenter view. Do you want me to share? Yeah, maybe try. Okay. Sorry, everyone, we'll get started in a minute. Let me just see if mine works. Okay. Can you see my screen now? Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, okay. Can you see that? Yeah, it's also in presenter view. <laughs> I don't know why. It is? Oh, it's not on my screen. It's still in presenter view? Mm-hmm. Try swap display. Yeah. Maybe that's the issue. There you go. Is that better now? Yep. Maybe that's yeah. Okay, so why don't you start? Okay. Um, so again, thank you for inviting me to speak today. Um, I'm again, Errol Jaffe. I'm one of the hepatologists and I work both in the Smilo liver cancer clinic and also in the transplant hepatology side. So have sort of perspectives from both aspects. Uh, next slide. So, you know, today's talk is really about liver cancer, which encompasses a few different types of um, cancers, but, you know, the main focus really will be on that of hepatocellular carcinoma, or what I'll refer to as HCC, as this really makes up about 90% of all primary liver cancers, but some of the same risk factors we see also lead to these other types here that you can see. So cholangiocarcinoma, which can include intra and extra hepatic bile ducts gallbladder cancer, and then very rarely um, angio and hemangiosarcoma. Next slide. So, you know, in terms of just the global statistics on hepatobiliary cancer, this is the most recent data from the SEER database. And um, what's very striking is really since the 1980s, liver cancer has not only tripled in incidence, but it's also doubled in its death rate, starting to maybe take a slight dip downwards. But in the United States, um, it's the fifth most common cause of cancer related death and the fourth most common worldwide, but it actually happens to be the fastest increasing cause of cancer related death in general. And despite all of our advances in treatments and 
um, medical therapy, as we're going to hear about tonight, it's still a pretty dismal five-year prognosis of only around 21.6%. So, you know, for some reason, we're not really making headway in improving mortality just yet. Slide. Um, one of the reasons, as you can see highlighted here, is we're still very poor at diagnosing this cancer early. And so, you know, really, this again is from the SEER database, and less than 50% of cases um, do we actually diagnose the disease before it's actually spread outside of the liver. And not surprisingly, you can see that the earlier that you diagnose something, um, you know, the more likely that you are to be able to have a prolonged survival. And the challenge is that, you know, clearly we're not screening patients appropriately. And with liver cancer, unfortunately, until it's extremely advanced, most patients, even if they have huge liver lesions, are really asymptomatic. So we need to work more on, you know, identifying patients who should be screened and improving um, really that aspect to identify patients early on. Slide. Um, what's really challenging this paradigm even further is that there's been a rapid shift in sort of the global epidemiology um, of this cancer. So, you know, due to sort of variations, including like global vaccination programs, but also really due to the rise in the obesity epidemic, we're now seeing that worldwide the leading cause of liver disease is fatty liver or metabolic associated liver disease. And we used to really think that liver cancer only developed in patients that had cirrhosis or in a variant of patients that had chronic hepatitis B. But what's really alarming is that studies are now showing in up to 30% of cases with metabolic associated liver disease, patients are developing cancer when they have limited and sometimes even no fibrosis. And this is alarming because of the vast um, just percentage of patients in the United States that have these risk factors like diabetes and obesity, most of them are not even followed by a hepatologist and are certainly not falling into our screening guidance. And so I think there's going to be a major shift in who is appropriate to screen. But, you know, as a hepatologist and just a general physician, it's always important to look at these risk factors and try to figure out should these patients be seen by a liver doctor and should we be screening, um, you know, all patients that have things like diabetes or obesity. Next slide. So, um, you know, unlike other solid organ tumors that really utilize the AJCC or TNM staging system, liver cancer is really unique in that we utilize a totally novel staging system called the Barcelona uh, Clinic Liver Cancer System. And this is obviously a very daunting and overwhelming slide, but basically, we utilize three factors when trying to stage patients. So it's not just about the tumor and the size of the tumor and if it's spread, but it's also most importantly about underlying liver function as well as the patient's performance status. And this staging system allows us to sort of subclassify patients based on prognostic subgroups. And this was a recent update in the staging system and it has become even more complex because as we'll see tonight, there have been advances in treatments and introduction of things like immune therapy early on where, although this can provide guidance, really our approach to care is not so like longitudinal um, and lateral. You know, we move between stages and it just highlights really the complexity with each case that we have and really highlights the need for sort of a very strong multidisciplinary discussion. Next slide. So as I mentioned, um, when discussing, you know, patients with liver cancer, although there are three factors that help us stage patients, by and far the most important, you know, factor that not only plays a role in what treatments patient can tolerate, but also plays a role in what your overall prognosis is, is your underlying liver function. Um, and we have some scoring systems and sort of objective markers that we can utilize. This includes things like the child um, Turco Pew class, which is both a mixture of objective data um, and lab variables, but also some subjective data, including, you know, the presence of encephalopathy or ascites. We also use the MELD score, which is purely objective um, based on your labs. And there are some newer sort of objective markers, including the ALBI score that may be a little bit more inclusive to, you know, give patients the benefit of being treated. And so, you know, um, next slide. You know, this sort of brings a point of really my role in the management of patients that have liver cancer. Um, I think as a hepatologist, this really highlights like our longitudinal care and involvement. And I think this really shows 
our involvement all the way from diagnosis through follow-up. But, you know, we are ideally being referred patients that have risk factors for liver disease. We're looking at those risk factors and identifying, okay, which patients should ideally be screened for cancer. Um, we evaluate why somebody may in fact have underlying liver disease. And when we identify the cause, we try to treat those causes. And then if we do identify somebody with liver disease, part of our role is to understand what their underlying liver function is, if there's any room to recompensate them, if they are decompensated. And we bring them forth to the tumor board where you can see we have a variety of different subspecialties that play a role because there are so many treatment options. And once a treatment is decided as a group, um, it doesn't end there. You know, we continue to see these patients closely to make sure that they don't decompensate after therapy. If they do decompensate, we try to do our best to recompensate them. And these patients will require lifelong imaging because there is a tremendously high risk of recurrence when it comes to liver cancer. Um, and so, you know, we try to preserve their liver function. We keep, you know, updated surveillance imaging. And then we're also constantly thinking, you know, is this patient a transplant candidate? Should we move to palliative therapies? Um, have they developed a second hit? Like what else can we do to kind of maintain and preserve their liver function? But, you know, this is not a one and done thing. And, you know, as a hepatologist, I think, again, preserving and keeping their liver care um, as best as possible is, is ultimately their, their guide to survival. Next slide. So as I sort of talked about, you know, although there is a rise in cases of liver cancer in patients that may have metabolic associated liver disease without cirrhosis, still the vast majority of cases do occur in patients with advanced liver disease or cirrhosis. And, you know, definitely in the United States, the most common causes we see are things like alcohol associated liver disease, metabolic, chronic viral hepatitis B and C, but there are a variety of other sort of genetic or autoimmune conditions that we pick up. And of course, we know that tobacco use and certain things like anabolic steroids can increase your risk as well. Um, so these are the things we're looking for when deciding should someone be evaluated um, to be screened. Next slide. And then, you know, once we identify, why is that important? Because really for almost any cause of liver disease, we have interventions that we can provide. So nowadays for viral hepatitis, you know, especially hep C, there's probably even higher than 90% efficacy in curing this disease. Hepatitis B, while there's no immediate cure, um, there's definitely some new medications in the pipeline, but we're able to suppress the virus, which we know is directly related to a reduced risk of cancer. Um, excuse me, for alcohol and tobacco use, you know, disorders, we can obviously refer patients to the appropriate resources, we have medications to help with some of those um, cravings for fatty liver disease and metabolic syndrome. We um, have pretty robust clinics here that not only deal with exercise and nutrition, but there are new medications in the pipeline, such as the GLP-1 agonists. And many of you may have seen this new medicine that's now getting um, expedited FDA approval to potentially reverse scarring in patients that have underlying fatty liver disease. And for different autoimmune or inherited disorders, we're able to immune suppress these patients. We can chelate those patients that have hemochromatosis or Wilson's disease. So this is just like, you know, a brief overview, but just to note, like there are ways that we treat them. So identifying and treating the cause of the liver disease is very important. Next slide. And then, you know, when we think about the treatment of liver cancer, sort of globally, it's broken down into two categories. So we have curative therapies, which include resection, which um, Dr. Billingsley is going to talk about, ablation therapy, which are different forms of either thermal, electrical, or um, chemical energy to directly destroy the tumor, liver transplant, and then our palliative therapies, which include the transarterial approach using either chemoembolization or radioembolization, um, stereotactic body radiotherapy, which is, um, I think, like a rising treatment in this field with more and more evidence behind it, and a great option for patients that may have poor performance status. And then, of course, really probably the most exciting advances in the field are that within systemic therapy. Um, and we're going to see, you know, from Dr. Stein, how these treatments are not only given now just for patients who have advanced disease, or horribly diffuse disease, but really even in all stages of, of um, disease, including those that are you know, potentially curative. 
I do want to highlight that outside of transplant, even patients that undergo curative treatment with resection or ablation still have an extremely high risk of recurrence. And so we know that even, you know, again, after resection or ablation, within five years, about 70% of patients will still recur. And right, that's because you're basically developing something in a failing organ. You know, you're not fixing the issue itself, which is really the underlying liver disease. Next slide. And so with that, you know, I want to highlight that not everyone is aware that transplant is actually a treatment option for patients that develop liver cancer. And it not only is a treatment and top option, it's actually one of the leading causes of the you know, reason we transplant patients. I think based on the most recent data, it's about the third leading cause or indication for transplant. And again, it's because it doesn't only cure the cancer, but it also cures the underlying liver disease. And we know that without a doubt in the appropriate selection, so not everybody is eligible for transplant, um, but in those that fit certain criteria where we feel there will be a low risk of recurrence, um, there's the highest five-year survival of over 80% and overall lowest risk of recurrence of about 10%. Like I mentioned in comparison to other therapies where even curative approaches are still a high risk of about 70% recurrence. And this just highlights, you know, that there are multiple ways to receive a transplant, either a whole organ or from a living donor. Next slide. And then, you know, this is interesting. This is actually data from our own institution. So we compiled like a very comprehensive um, database of over a thousand patients that have been treated at Yale. And this, you know, graph just depicts that of those patients, you know, we plotted their overall mortality and survival based on the first treatment. And again, what I want to highlight here is that, you know, in the top line, you can see that transplant, again, best long-term survival. And I think what's interesting is really in the past, there has been just a very small subset of patients that actually go on to receive systemic treatment. And there's no question that with the changing landscape and the advances in immune therapy, um, that will be offered at all stages of disease, you know, this number is going to dramatically increase. Next slide. I think one more. And so, you know, I think now more than ever, you can imagine using immune therapy, which right alters your innate immune system. There's been a lot of question of, is this safe if somebody is ultimately moving on to transplant? Is this going to increase the risk of rejection? And we do know that it's an approved therapy to downstage patients in the preparation for transplant, but it highlights the importance of, you know, hepatology and oncology working very closely together to figure out who's a candidate, the timing of immune therapy, um, can we give it? And if so, when someone's listed, when should we withdraw it to allow a safe washout period? So it's just added another layer to highlight, again, the importance of multidisciplinary care. Next slide. And sort of with that, I'll wrap up just to kind of highlight, like for care of patients with liver cancer, it really does take a village. Um, we have a very strong multidisciplinary approach. I think the liver tumor board, not that I'm biased, but I think objectively has the most cases and the highest attendance because there are so many players involved in understanding the treatment. Um, I've outlined again here, again, the variety of treatment options that are available. And I think it's really important to note there's not just like a typical algorithm we follow, it really matters how the patient looks, what their risk factors are, how their underlying liver function is. And really just as a hepatologist, you know, our roles are to identify these patients, screen them early, prevent recurrence by modifying risk factors, continue to survey them so that, you know, when most of them inevitably recur, we catch it early and can retreat them. And then really, like, I think lead the discussions on multidisciplinary care and review imaging at our tumor conference. And so um, with that, I'll thank you and look forward to hearing about some of the advances in our other treatments and I'll, I'll take questions at the end. Great, thank you. Can you see the slides now? Yes, you can see. Okay, perfect. Okay, so um, I will talk about um, systemic therapy, but I uh, entitled this combination therapy, and I am using the word combination in multiple contexts, as we'll as we'll discuss. Um, 
So to start with the same, you know, BCLC staging system, just to reflect when I started at Yale in 2010, um, this was a different um, appearing staging system. And under uh, here, under systemic therapy, there was just one word and it was serafinib. And um, it's really exciting and kind of amazing how much things have changed over the last few years where we're talking about multiple lines of therapy and really starting to increase um, survival. And so, you know, as we improve the systemic therapy options here, we start thinking about moving to the left of this um, system and thinking about, um, you know, approaches neoadjuvant, adjuvant in combination with local therapy, and also thinking about potentially, you know, going back to more curative options um, sometimes after a good response to systemic therapy. So um, really exciting. I'm going to jump right into kind of our first line, you know, regimens and think about how most of the patients are currently being treated when they start systemic therapy. So this study, the Embrave 150 study, was really a big game changer for first line therapy um, of liver cancer. And this was based on a phase one study where there was a 36% response rate. Um, which was a great signal. And so the study randomized patients to the combination of atezolizumab, PDL1 inhibitor, plus bevacizumab, a VEGF antibody, um, versus serafinib, which was standard of care and first line therapy. And um, about 500 patients went on this study, and there were co primary endpoints of overall survival and um, and progression free survival. And I think my slide of results somehow was deleted from this version, but I'll just, you know, go over that there was about an 18 month survival on the study. And that was really impressive. Um, the control arm of serafinib keeps improving also because most patients really do go on to receive a second line therapy. Um, and so this survival benefit really, you know, put this on the map. And in terms of safety, um, patients also felt better and le had less adverse events. So you can see, you know, on this plot here, um, there was less diarrhea, um, less uh, PPE, which is the hand foot skin reaction. Um, and overall, you know, the, the most common grade three, four adverse event on a TZO and BEV is hypertension, which we're usually able to manage well with medication. But I just wanted to point out that, you know, all patients... Um, are required to have an EGD before going on treatment to screen for varices. Um, but the risk of bleeding on this study was 4.5% with serafinib and about 7% um, with the combination. So if you screen people properly, um, the risk of bleeding on bevacizumab could be pretty well managed. And this was not just esoph uh, esophageal bleeding. Um, and so, you know, they... Um, obtains patient reported outcomes on this study and the um, median time to deterioration of symptoms was significantly better um, with this combination. So not only did we have a survival benefit, a response rate of 30% um, and less serious adverse events, but patients also reported that they were feeling better on this regimen. Uh, so this has really changed, um, you know, our first line uh, therapy. And then I wanted to mention the Himalaya study. That was another study that looked at a slightly different but very similar patient population with advanced disease. Um, and this was this study included over 1,300 patients and randomized them to serafinib. They received the combination of dervalimab with tremolumumab, which is a CTLA-4 antibody um, in one of the arms. Another arm, they received the dervalimab alone and the third arm was a serafinib control arm. And um, as opposed to the Ipinevo regimen that we use in some other cancers where the patients receive four doses of a CTLA-4 antibody, in this study, they only gave a single priming dose um, of the uh, tremolumumab. And the primary objective was overall survival um, for the combination. And so um, you could see that the so the the bar that's called the stride regimen that is the combination with the priming dose of the CTLA four antibody 
um, had an improvement in overall survival compared to the uh, Dervalimab arm or the serafinib arm. Um, the study also looked at Dervalimab versus serafinib, but did not directly compare the combination versus the uh, Dervalimab alone. So it was a little bit of a complicated statistical design was a positive study. The overall um, survival was over 16 months with the combination compared to the serafinib arm that also performed pretty well at over 13 months. Um, so this is another good option for patients for first-line therapy. Um, the use of steroids on this study was about 10% in the Dervalimab arm, but increased to 20% using the CTLA-4 antibody. So it's an important consideration. There's less of a risk of bleeding on this study, and patients were not required to have an EGD prior to enrolling. On the other hand, the combination with the CTLA-4 antibody does have a greater risk of having autoimmune adverse events that may require the use of high-dose steroids. So it's something to you know, compare and kind of contrast between those two studies about which you think is the right um, regimen for the patient that you're taking care of. And also, you know, we could come back to this in discussion, but just to keep in mind that all these studies are only performed in patients with child PUA cirrhosis or or the absence of cirrhosis. And so it doesn't necessarily reflect all of the patients we're seeing in clinic, which I would say the majority of the patients I see have child PUB disease. And so, you know, we have to think about how those patients do in terms of adverse events and whether we're seeing more toxicity. So it's really important to have that real world data also from the patients that we actually take care of in clinic. Um, so I'm not going to go through the, the tyrosine kinase inhibitor options, um, but to keep in mind, you know, there are some patients that really have an absolute contraindication to immune therapy. And so those patients, we still offer tyrosine kinase inhibitors. Um, and then there's some patients, you know, for other reasons. And then typically we use those in second and beyond lines. So we have linvatinib, cabozantinib, regorafenib, and serafinib. Um, but for the interest of time, I'm going to move on to some other newer data that I think is exciting and showing kind of where the future um, may be with treatment. So after the success of Atizo and Bev in first-line um, advanced disease, there was a study that looked at patients in the adjuvant setting. So this is the Imbrave 050 study. And basically, um, they looked at um, patients who had resection with certain high-risk features. So basically, like size of tumor, if there was um, if there was a lymphovascular invasion and tumor grade, et cetera. So they kind of defined a little bit of a higher-risk patient population that they focused on. And um, if you look at the curves in terms of recurrence-free survival for the um, for the arms of atezolizumab versus just surveillance um, alone, um, and there were over 300 patients in each arm of the study, the relapse-free um, event rates at 12 months had a 13% difference. So this was considered a positive study. You know, I think it um, interpreting the study requires a lot of reflection of thinking about balancing the potential um, offset of recurrence versus potential adverse events of the treatment. But I do think that there are some high risk patients um, that um, are motivated interested in doing something to decrease risk of recurrence that we definitely do um, discuss this with and have treated some patients with this regimen. And I do think that, um, you know, looking more at uh, the adjuvant population is going to be important. There are other ongoing studies um, looking at um, some different drug combinations in this setting that, you know, hopefully we'll be able to see in the next year or two. Um, but another area that I think is really exciting and might potentially offer, you know, more benefit, right, we'll have to see then in the adjuvant setting is the neoadjuvant setting. And so I just mentioned a study that um, we have open at Yale. This is the GO44457 study, um, which is basically 
looking at the Atezo and Bev combination. And also there's another arm looking at teraglamide, um, which is a LAG3 inhibitor that's also being looked at in the um, advanced setting in a different study. Um, the third arm is not open at, at the moment, but might be again in the future. And basically um, the patients will have, uh, they will be surgical candidates at the time that they enroll. Uh, have a biopsy be assigned to one of the treatment arms. Um, and then after some um, cycles of three cycles of treatment, they'll go on to their planned surgery. And what's very nice about this approach, right, is that we will have tissue then at the time of resection to really get a sense of how much tumor necrosis do they have? You know, what are certain markers of immune infiltration in these tumors? And then be able to... Um, you know, examine that later when we have more long-term data of patient recurrence and, you know, toxicity from treatment. And so, you know, the hope is that the other small studies, pilot studies that we've seen with neoadjuvant therapy that sometimes show a high incidence of necrosis, right? We don't know yet if that necessarily translates into better survival. But I think, you know, some of these larger studies are going to help us better elucidate that. And the hope is that we can really make a difference in terms of recurrence rates with this type of approach, right? But clinical trials at this point are really um, important. And um, I wanted to mention um, the Emerald One study. So this was... Um, the study that I was most excited to see at GI ASCO this year. Um, and uh, that's my bias, but <laughs> um, so this was a study that looked at patients who were eligible for taste. So now we're moving kind of to the left of that staging system and thinking about the taste eligible patients and asking the question, is it beneficial to have patients receive immune therapy combinations earlier on in their treatment? And so patients were assigned to um, taste in every arm and the first arm uh, received dervalimab um, and placebo um, with taste. The second arm received dervalimab plus bevacizumab. And then the third arm just received the taste with placebo. Um, and basically uh, they looked at um, several, um, you know, several indicators. So this just gives the schema of the of the arms, the number of weeks of treatment they received, um, potentially when they had, you know, taste and then future um, future imaging. And so this is early data that was presented looking at progression free um, survival, which uh, you could see at 12 months. Um, went from 40% to 55, and at 18 months from 28% to 43, and the median progression-free survival um, increased from 8.2 months with placebo and taste to 15 months. And so, you know, it'll be really exciting to see the more long-term data from this study, but this is giving a really good signal that, you know, potentially adding systemic therapy in earlier is going to be um, of benefit. So I wanted to mention that we have um, an IIT here at Yale looking at the Atizo and Bev combination in a similar group of patients that's enrolling and um, we'd be happy to have patient referrals for this study. I think this is a really exciting um, area and you know important to uh, think about potentially treating the right patients earlier um, you know, for uh, for potential right decrease in recurrence, and you know we really, in general, right as a paradigm, we really may make more increases in survival um, by moving you know treatment earlier. So a few things to think about, you know. Um, how do we kind of combine therapies most effectively, right? So is it that we um, give neoadjuvant? therapy to curative intent patients or adjuvant therapy. And then for the BCLCB patients, you know, is it right, is it going to be important to give them systemic therapy earlier? And then another topic, which I didn't have time for today, but I think is also really exciting is adding local therapy into the patients who are getting systemic therapy, right? So kind of the, the flip of the, of the last group of patients 
And there are some studies that have looked at the role of um, local regional therapy with TACE or with SBRT to patients with more advanced disease. And it does seem like the responses are better um, with at least an increased, um, you know, uh, progression-free survival. Um, it's unclear if this is from an abscopal effect or other effects, but I think really exciting area of research. And again, you know, I think it's important discussion to think about our child PB patients. So um, I will pass things on now to Dr. Billingsley to talk about surgical um, management. And do you have your slides up to share? Kevin, I'll uh, stop my share. I, let, I have my slides up. Let me see if I can share screen. Yes, yeah. I can, thank you. You're in the presenter mode too, so you may have to, yeah. Perfect. Okay. Well, thank you, Stacy and Ariel. And I am grateful for all of you intrepid people who are joining us on a Thursday evening on the eve of a Good Friday. Appreciate you all being here. Um, I share the excitement of my colleagues. You know, I just listening to Stacy talk and reflecting on my own, what is now um, an, a bit of an embarrassingly lengthy career in uh, HPV surgical oncology. And for so many years, HCC has been kind of this depressing corner of GI oncology. And in the past, I guess, five to eight years, there has been such a renaissance um, largely because of the introduction of these powerful immunotherapeutic agents, as well as more effective tyrosine kinase inhibitors. But it's also kind of understanding um, the treatment of hepatitis, improved supportive therapies, new surgical technologies, new ablative therapies. So it's really an exciting time, not only to see these new therapies come into the clinic, but also work with great colleagues and, and work together to integrate these uh, a variety of treatments for the, the benefit of the patients. So uh, as you can tell, my topic is evolving surgical strategies in HCC. And uh, Ariel has kindly touched on transplant. Um, and I'm also going to spend some time on transplant because it is such an important piece of the surgical thinking about this disease. Uh, although what I do personally is non-transplant liver surgery. So where do we stand in 2024? Um, as has been mentioned, when we think about HCC, it's unlike other cancers in that we have to kind of engage ourselves, not just as oncologists, but as um, a multidisciplinary team thinking of patients with significant underlying disease and the cancer uh, itself. Um, and the majority of our patients uh, are cirrhotic. You know, it's much easier to take care of this group of patients um, when they're non-cirrhotic patients. And a significant portion of the Asian patients are non-cirrhotic when they are diagnosed with HCC. In a Western population, as we deal with here at Yale and in Western Europe, the majority of patients do have underlying cirrhosis. Um, and that all impacts our surgical decision-making and management significantly. Well, you know, for a long time, um, meetings um, focused a lot on the discussion transplant versus resection. Who gets what? How do we how do we manage this decision? Um, I'm going to contend it's not really that much of a debate these days, um, and I think a lot of that has been. Um, settled by the clear-cut survival benefits of transplant in, in patients who are clearly eligible for it and whom we can bridge to that therapy and find an organ. I am going to spend a fair bit of time talking in this talk about patient selection for, for surgical resection. Um, uh, we do know, uh, and Ariel showed some of this data, that patients undergoing resection uh, for HCC can enjoy extended and long-term survival. 
And I think that one of the things that Stacy showed is that as we integrate adjuvant therapy or neoadjuvant therapy, the group of folks who we can get to resection are probably going to enjoy even greater survival in coming years. And I'm not going to geek out on you as a surgeon too much, but I will share a few technical developments in liver surgery that impact our treatments and decision-making for patients with HCC. Um, there have been multiple technical advances. Um, a lot of this has to do with the advent and uh, revolution in minimally invasive surgical technique. Um, first with laparoscopy and more recently with robotic liver surgery that I'm going to talk about. We now have very uh, sophisticated parenchymal uh, liver uh, division techniques, including ultrasonic dissectors, as well as the instrumentation we use in, with the robotic platform. Um, one of the things that is not really new in 2024, but has, we continue to refine is the anesthetic management of this group of patients and the advent of low central venous pressure anesthesia has facilitated um, a control of, of intraoperative bleeding substantially in liver resection. And taken together, um, liver resection is now a very safe procedure in experienced centers with a pa appropriate patient selection. The tough reality in HCC, however, is that as we look at our total population of patients, it is really the significant minority of them that are actually appropriate uh, surgical candidates, both on the basis of their significant underlying liver disease, as well as many patients are ruled out by the extent of disease. Sometimes the extent of disease in the liver, um, particularly with portal venous involvement or multifocality, and some of these uh, patients also have extrahepatic disease, which render them unresectable. As Ariel mentioned, staging is really the cornerstone of our surgical assessment and decision-making. Um, we really use the Barcelona Clinic Liver Cancer uh, Staging Program, which integrates tumor burden, including number of lesions and portal vein involvement, as well as an assessment of hepatic function. Uh, usually, um, we use the uh, child classification, sometimes MELD score. We also, in our decision-making, look very carefully at the patient's performance status. Uh, the BCLC has been validated in both Asian as well as Western populations. I'm gonna talk for a minute about the Milan criteria because everyone needs to be familiar with this. And in uh, our liver tumor board, we will often talk about patients who are in or outside of Milan. And that's not a description of their travel itinerary, but a description of their general stage and appropriateness um, for possible transplantation. Um, and it, this is one of the seminal papers in uh, hepatic oncology. Uh, Mazzaferro and colleagues in Milan, Italy, demonstrated that carefully selected patients, uh, folks going to liver transplantation with one tumor, uh, less than or equal to five centimeters or three or few tumors, no greater than three centimeters, enjoyed excellent long-term five-year survival of about 75%. And those um, are uh, outcome statistics that are very difficult to duplicate, even with aggressive um, uh, non-transplant surgery. So I would contend that transplant does remain the optimal treatment for patients with limited HCC and cirrhosis. Um, for a multitude of reasons. Those, these patients enjoy excellent survival that, of course, treats the underlying liver disease and uh, liver failure. And the promise uh, currently and in future years is um, the possibility of living donation to offer uh, a, a suitable graft for a larger population of patients. However, the stark realities are that um, organs remain profoundly limited in supply. Um, and many patients are limited as transplant candidates by um, either so so psychosocial barriers uh, um, or they have limiting comorbidities. And uh, people who undergo transplantation of, of course require intensive follow-up and lifelong support. So it's not uh, unfortunately, a, a, a treatment for everyone. So how do we evaluate the cirrhotic patient or patient with liver disease? 
as a potential candidate for resection. Uh, this is really a, a multidisciplinary evaluation, which I as a surgeon do kind of arm in arm with the hepatology team. Um, and there does seem to be a, a variance in approach between the Western population that we really take care of and the Asian approach. Um, Asian surgeons tend to rely on something called indocyanin green retention as a marker of, of liver function. Indocyanin green is a dye that can be injected and is cleared from the bloodstream through uh, hepatic metabolism, and it's measured at about 15 minutes transcutaneously. Uh, the more that is retained, the less well the liver is functioning. And it seems to be more effective, a better prognosticator in patients with hep B-related cirrhosis. In the Western population, we tend to use a more clinical approach, looking at a classification like Child's Pew, including bilirubin. And we also look very carefully at portal hypertension. And we look at clinical measures of portal hypertension, such as spleno, splenomegaly, splenomegaly, thrombocytopenia, size of the portal vein, and uh, we'll, we measure something that I'll talk about in detail in a minute uh, called hepatic vein wedge pressure, pressures. We also look at um, liver biopsies on occasion. So this is kind of data from an a international study looking at the correlation of indocyanin green clearance uh, with the fibrosis score. And you can see that the, there is a correlation between indocyanin green clearance and um, uh, the degree of cirrhosis or fibrosis, um, but it's rough and there is a lot of overlap. And I apologize, this is on the slide reversed. So the higher the indocyanin green is, uh, the, the uh, less functional the liver is and same in, in 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 the lower bar graph here, so it's a it's a it's a helpful but probably the not the most useful index in a Western population. We tend to use kind of imaging and clinical uh, characteristics more. This is a classic CT scan of a patient with a big spleen and multiple varices in the uh, left upper quadrant. Um, this is a, a coronal projection. Similarly, big portal vein, big spleen, multiple varices, not a good surgical candidate. So portal hypertension is really a seminal clinical feature for how we make decisions about this group of patients. And one of the classic studies that has helped us is, uh, in, in, in the utility of this marker is from uh, the Barcelona group that demonstrated uh, that after surgery, patients with a hepatic vein gradient less than 10 centimeters, almost all did very well without decompensation. They had a gradient of greater than 10 uh, millimeters of mercury. They almost all decompensated to some degree after liver resection. So this has proved to be a very helpful threshold. Um, how do we measure this? We, uh, the, the interventional radiologists do this uh, using a transjugular approach in which they maneuver a balloon catheter through the uh, uh, neck down through the superior vena cava. They uh, wedge this in a hepatic vein and um, uh, measure the distal pressure uh, against the free pressure in the uh, hepatic vein. And it's that gradient that really is the clinically useful index. Anything greater than 10 millimeters is really, um, at least for me, a no-go as a surgical candidate. We also selectively actually biopsy patients. Um, this can often be done at the same setting as the wedge pressure, uh, again, through a transjugular approach. Um, and this gives us a very precise histologic picture of the, the uh, severity of the fibrosis or cirrhosis. So you've seen this um, kind of schematic before, and I'm not going to go through it in, in exhaustive detail, but just focus attention on this far side of the graph, where when we think about patients who are surgical candidates, it's really this very early stage or early stage group of patients. If they are a potential candidate for transplant, um, we, will, we will often assess them clinically or measure their portal pressure. Patients who have a well-compensated liver 
uh, liver function and low portal pressures, this is the group that we tend to really look at favorably for resection. Uh, if their portal pressures are increased, they will probably decompensate with any kind of significant resection. And we go on to assess them for transplantation if they don't have significant associated diseases. So in summary, who are our candidates for resection? Generally patients without cirrhosis or with very well compensated cirrhosis and no, no significant portal hypertension um, uh, who uh, a hepatectomy can be performed without morbidity. Um, you know, then we deal with a group of patients with compensated cirrhosis, um, and then we get into nuances of very limited liver resections or uh, ablative approaches. So this is a, a nice kind of overall view of how we think about resection. Again, for the presence or absence of significant portal hypertension is very critical. Um, and then we start to think, if they don't have portal hypertension, how much liver can we safely remove? And, you know, in the main, we're looking at, at fairly limited hepatectomies in cirrhotic patients, and these are low risk. We start to do, um, if the MELT score is appropriate, we start to do major hepatectomies. We get up to more intermediate risk of liver decompensation. And um, this group of patients who have portal hypertension, uh, most of them are not resection candidates, or they are very high risk of decompensation after surgery. So... Who's in the green here with really a low risk of uh, decompensation? It's patients with good liver function, minor hepatectomy, and no portal hypertension. So very careful patient selection. So when it comes to doing the surgery, we've also had some significant evolution. Um, you know, years ago, liver resection tended to be a big, uh, you know, a major affair um, particularly for larger tumors, where we were often doing major hepatectomies of two or more segments. And this further limited the tolerance of patients with any underlying disease for liver resection. Um, we now do almost exclusively segmental liver resections, uh, where we are removing smaller portions of the liver uh, based on portal venous or portal pedicle anatomy, such as segment three or segment two for appropriately selected tumors. One of the technical nuances in this segmental resection is that when we do these operations, we know that these tumors have the capacity to spread by intravascular extension down the portal vein. So when we take, when we do even a small resection, we tend to resect the entire anatomic segment and the feeding portal pedicle to that segment so that we um, not only take out the segment, but we resect the feeding portal pedicle, which may have tumor involvement. Um, and this is a demonstration of if you, we don't do that, we leave a risk of residual, leaving residual tumor in the third order of portal venous branches in that area, uh, even if it looks like we've resected the tumor grossly. So there are some technical nuances to this. One of the things that has been exciting for me in the past five to eight years is to develop a robotic liver surgical practice. Um, this has presents some technical challenges. Um, uh, the liver is a large organ. Manipulating it with a robotic instrumentation can be challenging, but there are some clear-cut benefits, and I would contend some benefits over straight stick lap laparoscopy, including 3D stereoscopic vision, um, the wristedness of the instruments we use allows us to uh, suture precisely in difficult locations. And then we have a dual console for uh, instruction. So this is an uh, OR photograph of one of um, our cases here at Yale. You can see how we tend to plane the patient a little bit to gain additional access to the liver. There are a multitude of ports across the abdomen. The robotic arms uh, come out across the patient. Um, and the, ni the nice thing about this is when the procedure is done, there are usually about four to five very small incisions in the upper abdomen. And then we usually need to make an extraction port someplace in the lower and the, the mid abdomen. But I do think um, for these, particularly for segmental resections um, in patients with underlying disease that we're trying to minimize surgical impact, there are some uh, some benefits to it.
So as uh, Ariel has said, I will reiterate, um, all of these decisions are made as um, kind of a multidisciplinary consensus. Although, um, you know, we as surgeons bring the technical expertise, uh, kind of the functional assessment of the liver uh, is, we're aided enormously by the hepatologists. Uh, our radiologists, of course, uh, provide a lot of assistance with a deep understanding of the imaging characteristics and the precise location of the tumors. Pathologists and, uh, of course, Stacy and the medical oncology team are uh, playing an ever increasing role uh, as we integrate a, a systemic therapy um, into this group of patients, caring for this group of patients. Uh, so, with that, I'll stop sharing and open it up. Perfect. So, um, uh, so I know we have several people on. If you have any questions for any of us in the group, please feel free to um, put them in the chat, and I'll. And I'll continue to uh, to monitor that. Um, so, you know, I have um, a few questions. So, um, I'm thinking a lot about, um, you know, the uh, the role of transplants and how we think about best selecting. You know, those patients, right? There's a lot of gut, but how, but what else could we do to potentially, you know, look at these patients and think about the selection? You know, is um, Dr. Jaffe and I were having a conversation recently about circulating tumor DNA and thinking about what, if that somehow may fit into the paradigm of those patients, you know, do we think those patients may benefit? in some kind of neoadjuvant approach in the future. So really interested in hearing your thoughts. Yeah, no, I think, you know, we sort of always discuss that, unfortunately, like our use of biomarkers in this field is really limited, right? You know, we have AFP, but only like 20 to 30% of patients even make AFP. And unfortunately, radiographically, until a tumor is of like a reasonable size, you sometimes can't see it, right? We've seen many recent cases of surprising explants. So I think there's definitely, like I'm super excited about the idea of circulating tumor DNA. And I think that if we can start to show that that is a surrogate or a marker um, and correlate that with explant findings, it's really helpful because, you know, we need to be very selective. And unfortunately when patients are transplanted and have high tumor burdens or vascular invasion, you know, it's very it's very tricky to use immune therapy in the post transplant setting. Um, the risks are very very high post transplant, not as much pre transplant. So we need to be we we need to be better about selecting because I think things are often missed, unfortunately, on imaging, which is challenging. Um, but I think we feel confident enough with the data that's out there that you know using it in a pre-transplant setting is safe. It's just, you have to time it appropriately, which is challenging because you can't always predict when an organ's gonna be available. Um, I also wanted to highlight just from the transplant side, like Kevin brings up the question of, should we resect, should we transplant somebody? Um, but I think that it's important to know there's been a lot of modifications in the rules for when you get exception points. So if someone goes on to recur actually after getting a resection, they actually can bypass waiting six months to get exception points. It's considered like a higher risk recurrence. So we don't, you know, I think we still favor resection if we can do it. Um, it doesn't necessarily disadvantage a patient because if they do recur, they can sort of jump to get exception right away. Yeah, no, those are great points. Um, you know, also, right, we often think about um, potentially downstaging patients to be able to be in transplant criteria. And what do you think about the future of downstaging? You know, will that continue to be local therapy alone? Or, you know, should we be thinking about systemic therapy potentially as in part of that role? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think that the role of systemic therapy is going to play a major role, not only in preventing recurrence, but also I, I think implementing it early in combination or even sometimes alone as therapy for downstaging. So, you know, it's recognized actually by the National Liver Review Board, which is sort of the governing body that puts forward policies about 
um, organ transplant that they approve of, you, you know, immune therapy as a potential downstaging technique. So I think the data you presented is very exciting and there's no question that I think we're going to start implementing it really anywhere from even pre-resection, you know, to combination with other sort of our typical downstaging like taste and, you know, ablation therapies. And it, it, it will be utilized more and um, it should be utilized more because you can potentially even save someone from needing transplant. You know, I, yeah. I'll just jump in there and say, I, I, I would, I think we're on the arc that many other cancers have been on and we're just getting there in which there's going to be increasing integration of local regional therapy with systemic therapy. And, you know, we, uh, we used to think, well, maybe surgery will go away, but I think what we've seen in other areas, and I think a lot about my career, how metastatic colorectal cancer we used to resect very few of those patients, but as chemotherapy became more effective, we actually have the opportunity to definitively treat more of them. And I'm kind of optimistic that we will see the same thing here, a combination of, of IO with TACE plus minus ablation, maybe Y90 will really control things and may treat extra micrometastatic extrahepatic disease. And we will look, you know, a small subset of patients may be resection, but another larger group of patients who have very compromised liver function and we get through, you know, a year or more of treatment, they will be solid transplant candidates. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think like even anecdotally, right? Like how many times in tumor board do we now say, okay, someone's been on immune therapy for 10 months and like they just like most of their disease has melted and then we readdress, you know, re-adding local therapy. Um, so there's no question that it's it's completely changing the landscape and I think is going to be a, a major backbone, not only just in bridging and downstaging, but just in all stages of treatment. Yeah. One of the um, things that we haven't touched on, but I think is worth you know, discussing a little bit is, um, you know, I, I think most people are aware of the role of hepatitis B, hepatitis C, and alcohol, mm -hmm. right, as causes for um, cirrhosis and liver cancer. But what we really are seeing a lot of, right, is is metabolic disease. And um, I'm just wondering about your thoughts, um, you know, to the whole panel of, are we effectively screening these patients, <laughs> you know, and I think, I think we're not, but, mm -hmm. you know, how can we do a better job, right? If we're thinking about expanding, you know, this discussion into primary care, um, you know, how could we do a better job of identifying these patients? Because I think why we would all acknowledge that treatment outcomes, you know, as you mentioned earlier, always better, the earlier we can detect, right? And we're seeing more patients, I think, really presenting, with, you know, in that, in that uh, graph that you showed of how many patients receive systemic therapy as their first treatment option, right? I think a fair number of those probably fall in this category. Yeah, it's a great, it's a great question. And like, despite fairly striking data that shows like 30% of people will not have cirrhosis and develop cancer. When you think globally in terms of like just the number of people you know, worldwide, but in the US, you know, that have diabetes and, and obesity, it's still like overall low incidence. But I think from like a primary care perspective, what's important to know is that patients with metabolic disease, they often like don't have strikingly elevated liver tests, right? Their AST and ALT may be like 40 and 50. And a lot of times doctors say, you know, nothing to worry about, but we really know that of all risk factors, diabetes puts you like fivefold risk of developing significant fibrosis. So anyone that has diabetes with findings of steatosis on imaging should automatically have some form of fibrosis staging because it is striking how many of these people have advanced fibrosis or even cirrhosis. So I think being aggressive with, you know, screening for fibrosis, especially in diabetics, um, and then referring them to hepatology for further assessment of should we screen or not. The challenge comes right now that it's not really supported by the ASLD, right? So if you're non-serotic, either with fatty liver or with hep C, 
because the global incidence is still very low, it's not recommended you screen these patients. Um, but, you know, sometimes I say, hey, like this person has metabolic disease and they drink and they may have hep C because that's actually really the typical patient. It's usually not an isolated risk factor. I will sometimes screen these patients or if they have some advanced fibrosis on imaging, you know, maybe it's not fully cirrhotic yet, but I do screen. But I think looking for fibrosis because it can be surprising based on how mildly elevated people's labs are is, is the first step because many patients are cirrhotic and you have and are totally missed. Yeah. And for the patients that you identify with fatty liver, you know, what do you think the um, future will be in terms of these new, you know, obesity um, and diabetes medications? Yeah, I think, I mean, I have to tell you, like I prescribe the GLP-1 agonists all the time now. I mean, obviously throughout all of 2023, FDA approval came that you didn't have to just have diabetes. I mean, it's still a jump with insurance, but um, they're, um, they're very effective drugs. And to be honest, there have been studies that have shown actually reduced risks of like liver cancer development with the use. So they've, they've studied different diabetic drugs. Like we know insulin can actually be potentially pro carcinogenic just because of, it, of its growth factor effects. Whereas GLP-1 agonists and metformin seem to be protective. So I'm very pro starting people. Like if you're obese, you're not, you're having trouble losing weight. Um, you're diabetic, even not necessarily diabetic, like I start them. Um, it'll be interesting to see this new medication that was approved, which is sort of like a thyroid receptor agonist that is an accelerated FDA approval. But, um, you know, that's a, very exciting because that's actually the first therapy that will be FDA approved other than weight loss. So I am super aggressive with the prescribing these medications. I think they're very, very effective. Yeah. Unfortunately, they're like all on shortage now. So people start and then they can't get it filled. <laughs> they're in high demand. Yeah. What do you think about potentially, you know, um, improving, uh, you know, patients' profiles from someone who may not have been a great surgical candidate um, because of weight or fatty liver with the use of these medications? You know, I will say, I think it's it's too early to tell. I, I do have some optimism you know, one of the things that is a challenge for surgeons is often we are pressed to operate in a fairly short time period. Um, and some of these are changes that require, you know, months. That being said, um, there is a literature that that supports the the idea that even with appropriate dietary modifications, low carbohydrate high protein diet, um, fatty liver changes can be reversed. And that literature comes out of really the, the liver resection population for metastatic disease. Now, what of course is more difficult is by the time we are seeing patients with primary liver cancer, um, you know, they have metabolic associated liver disease, but they also have fibrosis and, you know, more advanced liver disease. And, you know, as we all know, unfortunately, that's, that's not easily reversible. Um, so it's, it's going to be more difficult, but. Yeah, I think it'll be interesting. It really is. I think it's exciting when there's a new avenue that will potentially, I think, really improve people's, you know, outcomes over, over a long time. Um, any any other thoughts that either of you have that you want to share with the group that you didn't get to include? I know I kind of curbed the number of slides, <laughs> you know, because I wanted to make sure that we had time to get through everything. But any other thoughts that you really wanted to share with the with the group? I think, you know, like one of the slides you brought up of next steps is really important, right? Because although like clinical trials pick this you know, perfect subset of patients that are well compensated, their labs are perfect, that really is not the reality. And so, you know, I think child score is, it is very subjective, right? I mean, there are some objective variables, but it's super, it's very important to look at these patients, understand what's driving, like their values being abnormal, um, and not just writing them off. And I think it's important as a group to like, really assess what we think someone's underlying liver function and tolerability is for, you know, either undergoing surgery or tolerating some of these medications that 
are, you know, technically not approved, but it's, I think I really look forward to seeing some good, like, you know, randomized data that can really show what, like, you know, what, what we could push the envelope with to treat, I think the vast majority of patients that are affected by this disease, because it really, I mean, child A is like a rarity that we see that, right? Yeah, and Kevin, any final thoughts? Oh, I, a couple of things. One is that I um, would share that I think as we have all touched on, you know, HCC primary liver cancer has gone from a totally kind of therapeutic nihilism, hopeless situation to a, a, a bounty of multidisciplinary opportunities for meaning, meaningful therapeutic intervention with extended survival, even for patients with fairly advanced disease and compensated liver function. So lots of reasons to be optimistic. Um, you know, the other thing that I do reflect on, and I'm thinking about it in this conversation, is that we are still getting to these patients late. And, you know, there are lifestyle modifications that can make a difference, um, you know, with this burgeoning population of uh, metabolic liver disease. Yeah, it's great we have these new drugs, but there are some relatively straightforward dietary and exercise things get, that can make uh, an impact if implemented early. And um, obviously there are other lifestyle factors that impact liver disease. So lots of opportunity um, for our partners up front from us as oncology interventionists to, to impact uh, the incidence of this disease. So something to think about moving forward. Yeah. Agree. You know what? I just like to say, although we have three people, you know, on this panel today, really, I think we're also appreciative of the larger multidisciplinary team that we work with every day that we're in liver tumor board with that we reach out to, you know, on the phone all the time to discuss patient care. We have our pathologist, radiologist, um, interventional radiologist, um, you know, our transplant surgeons, our radiation oncologists. And then of course, you know, as you were alluding to Kevin, we have our nutritionists and social workers and palliative care team and all these other people that really help us, you know, manage these patients. So um, I think we're all very lucky to have such a kind of large and broad group um, that can really help us with the management of these complex patients. And, um, you know, I feel like there's a lot of work to do, but, but, you know, looking back, right, we could also say that there's been a lot of changes over the last decade and improvement. So I think things will only continue to accelerate. Um, so next year, when we do this, we'll have even more updated data for everyone. I'd really like to thank everybody that uh, stayed on for our program uh, this evening. Um, and uh, we look forward to sharing more data with you in the future. Thanks, everyone. Everyone. Thank you. Have a good night.